Hello, and welcome to our June 2016 episode of the Mozilla Curriculum Workshop. I'm Chad Sansing. I work as a curriculum developer for web literacy at the Mozilla Foundation. Today we're broadcasting live from our Mozilla All Hands meeting in London. And we'll be talking about summer learning uh, with a group of just awesome guests. It's been a while since our last broadcast, so I'd like to remind us of a few logistical details that'll help the show go smoothly for everyone. If you know anybody who might be asking, why haven't we started yet? Please invite them to refresh the landing page in their browser. Our live stream should kick in once they do that. Moreover, and supremely importantly, this is a participatory webcast, so you, the audience, are vital to its success. Please go ahead and share your questions, answers, ideas, and resources in the Etherpad embedded below. You can use the chat on the right of the pad or type directly into the pad itself. Please be sure to name yourself in the upper right-hand corner of the Etherpad near the little square of color so we know who you are. Now about halfway through the show, we'll switch into prototyping summer learning resources right there on the Etherpad itself, and we encourage you to join directly in that work as well as to join the work on any documents or media we link to from this pad. If you're curious to explore more about summer learning, or maybe to carry some of that learning forth into our upcoming Mozilla Festival this fall, please take the episode as an opportunity to connect with our guests and other audience members that you find and discover in the chat and on the pad. All right? And for the rest of our introductions, I'm going to turn things over to my peerless co-host, Amira. Thanks, Chad. Um, I just actually noticed in the Etherpad that we uh, we hadn't made room for people to share uh, their names and their location, their Twitter handles. So if you're joining us, please do remember to add your information there after line 15. Um, and welcome, everyone, and it's great to have you here. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about summer learning. I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, and a lot of learning that we've had, particularly um, in this exciting time and space of the year. Uh, so I'm really excited to dive into that and share more with this group of people and the people here with us today, um, as well as get the expertise from our three uh, very different but very exciting um, participants who have joined us today. So I'm going to jump on in and start uh, first with who's in the Etherpad. So Sue, uh, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, Hi. Please do it yourself. Tell us a little bit about you uh, and what you have done either now or in the past as it relates to summer learning. Um, so, uh, Sue Adams, um, I'm based in, uh, in Kent in the UK um, and I, I'm a Mozilla Club's regional coordinator. I'm also Code Dojo um, lead mentor and Code Week ambassador. Uh, I've worked in schools and outside of them running after schools clubs as well as um, free sessions and workshops and all sorts as well. So uh, lots of different um, things that I've done in the past. Uh, um, and um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much a roundup. <laughs> Nice. Thank you, Sue. Um, Bud, you're next on the list. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you and uh, what have you done or ever done as it relates to summer learning? Uh, well, hi. I'm Bud Hunt. Uh, I'm uh, the currently the IT manager for a public library district. Uh, I've been here about a year learning uh, what it means to run infrastructure for informal learning spaces. Uh, the past 10 years before that, I was a technology coordinator for a public school district here in Colorado where I was responsible for professional learning for a lot of teachers. Um, and largely, that happened in the summer. We seem to have decided in many of our schools that teachers learn in June, July, and parts of August, but not the other nine months. Um, so I'm interested in fiddling with that. I've always been interested in this mix between formal and informal learning environments and how we balance the best of both uh, in the other space. Nice. Um, you're getting some love for your framing over there in the Etherpad. Um, can the, the real Chris Rogers, as it says in the Etherpad, please stand up and tell us uh, a little bit about yourself um, and what you do as it relates to summer learning or have done as it relates to summer learning? Hey, everybody. Uh, Chris Rogers out of Philly. Um, 
So my current role, which I'm sort of like closing up now, is a librarian technology coordinator, and I also teach language arts uh, for an independent school. Um, outside of that, a lot of community sort of like grassroots work. I do a lot of work in sort of like teacher networking. We have this group, Teacher Action Group Philadelphia, a lot of teacher activists talking about quality education for all in Philadelphia. So I, I'm around the city a lot. And then during the summers, I also worked with, uh, we have a program in the U.S. Uh, known as Work Ready which really like grants and sort of like state funding to get young people employed over the summer. And through that you do a lot of work in like informal learning spaces and community spaces and trying to make that a really meaningful learning experience and also trying to figure out how to sort of like network many of those sort of like necessary workforce training skills. Um, I think Sue was speaking about like coding and um, technology like right now in Philadelphia that is you know where the economy is going and having our young people um, really embrace the skills and also the attitudes and mindsets that they need um, for that. I've been doing that for a couple summers and teaching a class on it too, so which is really cool. Um, so it's fun. Nice. That sounds fun. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Great to have you here. Great to have all of our speakers here. Uh, and I did notice that Bud actually added to a bunch of his camp counselor uh, duties in the etherpad um, there in the chat, so thank you for that. Seemed appropriate today, right? Bug juice, campfires, music. And kumbaya, right? Every now and again, you know, it's that's the, uh, that's the free bird of summer camp right there. Perfect. Um, thank you all. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Chad, but I'm just going to do a shout out to the audience and anyone we have joining us and to our speakers. Um, that if you have questions as we uh, talk in, throughout this time, please do add them in the etherpad either in the chat, somewhere in the actual pad, um, and we will pick it out and ask along the way. So please do jump on in and, and share conversations and specifically ask any questions that you have to anyone. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Chad. Thank you. Uh, I'm super excited for tonight's conversation on prototyping. This is a great group of guests for this topic. So without further ado, here is question one. So where you are in the world, like where you're local, what are the opportunities but also the challenges you have in programming summer learning or out of school learning? Um, how do you use the opportunities and how do you meet the challenges that you face? Um, I, uh, I've, I've found there's a few different challenges personally, um, as there always is with anything that you try and uh, undertake. Um, one of the main challenges that I have here is, is getting space to be able to host um, any events and any uh, sessions that I'm going to run, um, it can be challenging because if you choose a school, um, I tend to find that only the children who actually attend that school um, feel comfortable to, to attend, so I, I guess it's territorial. Um, also, uh, if you do then find a, a venue, uh, often they're um, lacking in some of the other facilities such as Wi-Fi, which is why the curriculum that we have at Mozilla is so great because there's lo-fi and um, no-fi uh, activities as well, so, um, so that's always very helpful. Um, but also, I don't know whether this is uh, I, I assume this isn't specific to the UK by any means, but with the introduction of the new computing curriculum in 2014 uh, in the UK, we have a lot of schools who have um, embraced it, um, and there are a lot of children who know that they love coding, they know that they love programming and computing, and um, anything that that encompasses, uh, but you also have a, gr a great group of children who have no idea that this might be their their thing um, and they're missing out and they don't even know that they um, they could have these opportunities. Um, so uh, it, it's it's great to have the opportunity to be able to engage those children at some free workshops, and um, which is another thing that I love about Mozilla Clubs, to be able to actually um, offer those uh, for free um, and try and get people along and having the curriculum there to support that. I, I would agree with Sue on, on issues of space. Um, we're at a public library now that, that is outgrown its physical plant. So if you want to run an event, you've got to fight with four other events to, to find room to have it. Um, the room that I'm in is a meeting room that's also a storage closet that's also uh, the primary uh, and the only private office in the building. So, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Um, space in schools can also be a challenge. But one other issue that I'm, I deal with and have dealt with for a long time is geography. Um, Northern Colorado is very spread out. There's a lot of people here, but we're spread out over, it's a 40-minute drive to the next big town, um, and that's 
that doesn't sound like a lot, except that it is. So figuring out how you um, get people from place to place uh, in spaces like these is a, is a challenge. Uh, and then figuring out how to use technology to connect those spaces can often be a logistical nightmare as well. Um, as an informal learning person now, or right now, also figuring out how to build community uh, when things tend to happen in one-shot deals is a big deal. So um, I run a monthly uh, technology evening here at the library, and it's different people every month, and it's a different topic every month, and trying to figure out ways to stitch some sense of continuity across that uh, is a challenge that I, that I didn't really face when I was working with teachers in a school um, who met together on a regular basis. Those were different community uh, needs and issues. Hey, um, so in, in Philly, I think I'm thinking of like really two things right now. One is, and I I think Bud sort of spoke to this, Sue spoke to this, of like there's a really an uneven development in the city. And he talks about like inequity. Um, so we have, you know, a number of spaces and there are places that, um, and parents and that have resources that can, you know, bring sort of like high power computing experiences and um, you know, robotics and these sorts of ways of engaging uh, with technology to really create some like fun experiences. Then we have other parts of the city where we're sort of like trying to network as much as these sort of like uh, resources that we have from like the public spaces. We are blessed in Philly with a great free library system who has a, um, a number of things. We're trying to figure out how to network those things, like both internally in the library system, but then like externally to community providers and community organizations is a is a is a um, I don't know. It's a it's an opportunity or a challenge, you could say. And then I think I think the other thing, um, what I feel is the the meaningfulness, the purposefulness of the summer work that we're engaging in. Um, we in in my work, we're dealing with a lot of high school students. Um, that sort of like time that they have in summer is very precious to them. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about me at their age. The idea of me creating going to like a pickup basketball game on like a Tuesday was like amazing versus me sitting at a computer. <laughs> and that room better have air conditioning if I'm going to be sitting at that computer. Um, so like that sort of like purposefulness and and engaging that within like a real and authentic experience has been an, is another sort of like opportunity of like how do we bring the conversation about technology um, and the skills, the necessary skills they need as they move about the world in a way that is purposeful and meaning to, meaningful to them as a high schooler in the summer. So yeah. I think this is uh, definitely uh, something to come back to if you think about opportunities that come to mind or audience members. If you have particular questions about opportunities or challenges or you know resources that might be of interest to us, please go ahead and put them in the pad or put them in the chat. Um, Amira, you want to follow up with uh, another question? Sure thing. I'd love to. Um, oh, so follow-up question to that are, what are some of the key characteristics um, of summer out of school learning, and how can we help former learning spaces like school classrooms adopt them? Can, can I just pop in real quick and say I didn't hear opportunities uh, when Chad originally asked the question, and I feel like I should say uh, something about that real quick. One of the great things about being in a public library now as opposed to a school with a, with a curriculum and, and sort of a, a, a scope and sequence, even a bad one sometimes can be useful, is one of the great opportunities here is that anything is um, doable, right? Which is also a terrible challenge because anything is doable, right? And the world is amazing. So where do you start and how do you get people to invest in one or two particular things? Um, which also gets to one of the um, pieces of your, of your next question, right? One of the key characteristics of a lot of the summer experiences or the fringe during the school year experiences that I've seen uh, in my work with the writing project or in schools or in, in libraries is, is this notion of freedom, right? Like, that folks choose whether or not they want to get involved in summer learning. I'm not sure that school is always a choice, um, but but find, like playing and spending time with a passion is all about choice, um, all about in, investment that you can walk away from at any time. So um, I think that's really important, and I think that's really important for schools as well as for informal spaces. Um, but this notion that I'm here because I want to be, and if this if this isn't working for me, if this isn't useful for me, if I'm not getting something out of it, I can I can use the rule of my two feet and just get out of here. Um, no big deal. 
there's definitely a fuel behind that as well, following off for what Bud said. Um, the, the fact that they're able to choose to be there um, gives the whole, uh, the whole workshop that you're running at the time a different level of zing. Um, so uh, definitely that's one of the characteristics, the, um, the kind of um, atmosphere of a, um, a summer workshop or program or after schools club is, is very different from, um, and it's, it's a lot more of a, um, a, a peer type arrangement. It's not like in a class where it's a, a lot more, um, dict not dictatorial, but uh, a lot more give and, and take, uh, at least for a proportion of it. There has to be some sort of friendliness to it as well, I think. Um, but going on from that and um, you know the other thing there are several other uh, characteristics which um, specifically uh, you, you would see in a, a program or I certainly do varying ages is one of them you won't get just that age group um, and that can have quite an interesting impact um, on the dynamics um, also varying skill levels which sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier um, but these can provide going back to opportunities um, opportunities of their own um, so uh, you, you because the age has no relevance to the skill level you can have children who are six um, who are teaching children who are 12 how to um, how to create a circuit using all sorts of amazing and fun tools uh, just because they, they get that um, so uh, there's a real opportunity for children to become mentors um, and, and removing some of the barriers that might normally exist um, and one of the things that you asked was um, how how those can be brought into uh, a school environment. Um, I think Digital Leaders is a fantastic model um, for how you could use mentoring in a school environment. It works extremely well. Um, and also um, the participatory learning as well that you see in some uh, programs, they have to be fun. We want everyone to attend. They've, they've got to be inviting. If they're not, then people aren't going to keep coming. Um, and as you said, Bud, they're, they're going to walk, uh, they're going to vote with their feet and they're going to walk. Um, so we make it participatory. We make it really active, really engaging. We include things like Internet of Things and um, making projects instead of um, just teaching a concept and moving on to the next thing. It's about teaching and embedding in that one session and building on it in future sessions as well. So obviously Obviously that does happen in schools but um, the, the dynamics are different and that can I think be brought into school environments with something like digital leaders. So. Um, so just before anyone else jumps in, um, you mentioned digital leaders I think it yeah. was, is a, is a good model. Can you just explain to everyone on this call what, what that is and how that is a good model? Absolutely. Um, digital leaders is, uh, when, when I was working in the school it's something that I employed. Um, it was fantastic. So uh, you literally employ the children. So you invite them to apply for a job role. Uh, obviously they don't get paid, but they get amazing experiences instead. So um, when they were my digital leaders, they got to attend events like MozFest alongside me and to um, attend um, talks and presentations that I would do and be there as a, um, a, as a support and actually talk um, and present with me. Um, they also have the opportunity to um, to try out new products and um, software and hardware that we would bring into the school and they're also a support mechanism for the teachers as well. They would provide training sessions, they would provide assemblies, um, but they had to apply for this job and that was really, really hard, I, uh, having to sort of make decisions and turn people down and uh, I, I definitely did not like that aspect of it, but um, it makes the whole thing very real um, and very, uh, you know, they really do take it very seriously, um, gain a lot and then share a lot as well. So, yeah, how, does that answer the question? Does that get across everything that it is? Definitely. It's, it seems like a really exciting model of leveraging the learners turned teachers and implementing people in that setting. So I, I did, I did um, like it when you were mentioning it briefly, but that does give a lot more clarity. Thank you. You're um, and um, it's, in my experience, um, some of the like the greatest examples that I've, I've noticed um, haven't been the ones that are focused on technology, um, but technology has been there, and that's, I'll sort of talk about that. Um, one organization that we have in Philly, SOS Boat People, um, they are um, an advocacy organization for um, a growing, um, beautiful Vietnamese uh, migrant. Um, population that we have in Philadelphia and one of their summer programs is like a deep intensive um, um, history study 
that uh, high school students are engaged in and looking like walking around the neighborhood meeting with elders and talking about the experience between you know the uh, travel uh, like being at home in uh, Vietnam the traveling the experience and then also the uh, experience in Philadelphia and the uh, um, the resilience of that story and also the challenges of that story um, and then watching the students like bring that together and find different ways to represent that using uh, different forms of media like a, 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 a deep um, engaging community base um, ethnic studies is there right and connecting with something that you can't really get into our like uh, well we have spaces but we're not there yet the public school system to really like deeply engage with like identities and these so like identities that are outside of the center um, and then another organization um, I know they're in they're in our South Philly uh, but like urban gardening and I Sue spoke to um, like the role of like different varying skills, varying age levels, and seeing the people come together. And just imagine like high school students and middle school students and uh, you know like fifth graders and tenth graders coming together to collectively nurture a garden. Um, it's an <laughs> it's an amazing thing, right? And Bud, you talked about sort of like the consent. Right, the, the the active consent that is necessary in these experiences that you you everyone's choosing to come, um, and just to see people like deeply engage in that and like nurture some things and get some plants out of it by the end of the summer and are able to sort of like eat that eat the fruits of their labor you know literally is um is a beautiful thing, um, and using how to use technology sort of like document and tell the story of what's happening throughout the summer is also like a a really interesting piece, but like the 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 meaning comes out of the the work, and you're not like uh, trying to make that up or force it with the technology, but that sort of like deep community engagement and then using technology to like amplify that. Great stuff that I've seen. I wish it was done in schools. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe there is a way to bridge that. I I love the idea. Um, I just like a couple things, like the garden idea is something that I was just like my eyes open. I was like, yes, that's beautiful and collective, but then really um, adding an element of community there. So I think for for school and summer learning, doing things within the school setting or outside the school setting, but also involving outside community to come in and participate in that in those various settings is really powerful. And, and I think too, it's about building community in the learning space, right? I, I, when I think. I've done a lot of curriculum development work, and and I think a lot of times the content in the curriculum is is the MacGuffin, right? I mean, it's it's the thing that gets you there. It's the it's the thing you're pretending to do. But what you're really doing is learning how to learn, or you're learning how to be in community with other people, or you're learning how to figure out uh, what I call the the habits and routines of of learning, right? Um, or exploring, and you're building the mindsets that you want people to have. So. Um, I think it's really important to think about when you're building these spaces, and this is true of formal and informal learning spaces, like what are the rules of the community, what are the habits and expectations of all the folks that are in there, how do you build those, perpetuate those, and make sure that they are um, bringing the community back, they're, they're nurturing the community in some way. Definitely, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw it to Ch uh, Chad, who I think has a follow-up question for us. Yeah, before we move on to prototyping, maybe we just get a few thoughts on, on the following from each of you. So there's an audience question in the pad that says, how can we connect the learning that happens in informal spaces with the learning that happens in schools? Like when a student has learned something outside of school, how can we honor that in school? So I'll frame it this way. Um, if you've seen examples of schools that kind of honor that outside learning in like a new way, not in the, oh, you read X amount of books this summer and submitted X amount of book reports kind of way, but uh, different kinds of learning. Learning that we don't typically think of being recognized uh, by schools in that way. Please share those with us. Um, or just like describe how you'd like to see this kind of learning be recognized in schools when, you know, when we return for uh, the fall in the United States, for example, or you know, where you're local. One real quick thing I'd say is it'd be cool if at school we stopped being surprised by the fact that things happen outside of school. Um, like, <laughs> oh, wow, you read a book just because? Like, I, I think a lot of times when we get into trying to honor, it's suggesting that school is the place where learning is supposed to happen, and isn't it great that you did this thing that wasn't at school? And let's validate that thing you did by giving you some sort of currency, right? You talked about that with the book report thing. Like, um, so making sure that we're not 
cheapening the experiences of kids and grown-ups by um, handing out, like, here's, here's your badge for doing the thing. Thank goodness you did a thing because we're the place where things are validated. I, just, I feel like that's really important. Um, and I've seen teachers do this masterfully by inviting students to embrace or become experts on things throughout the year, right? So, hey, I know that Jane is really interested in gardening, right? And we're going to spend some time doing plants. Jane, how about you help us understand what this thing is? Uh, allowing them to be in that role of expert formally is great, um, but but not also not forgetting that like school is only a small percentage of the time that a kid uh, or a grown-up is alive and awake and aware is really important. Yeah, I wanted to... Uh... I remember one of my one of my good friends. Uh, he has this cool well, a story that he says of like um, teachers always say, "Well, we're preparing you for the real world." And one time, one of the students said back, "You don't understand. The world I go home to is real every day." Um, and like honoring that, right? That um, the challenges, the joys, the experiences experiences that uh, students have are like ample material that we that we are using in the classroom. One of the um, one of my favorite organizations that I've seen uh, do that is Detroit Future Schools. Um, they have an amazing toolkit um, that I probably should post into the um, Etherpad um, soon for everyone to see. But uh, am amazing, of like really holding up place and that, you know, uh, that the communities that we come from and the histories that they bring along with them into um, the school is necessary and important, and particularly um, around the issues of uh, social justice and building, you know, um, organizing communities towards um, some more like equality and equity. It's really important. And um, yeah, I just wanted to name them, and I'm going to post their stuff. I might get some more out of this, but yeah. <laughs> And I've, I've got a, a couple of things that kind of spring to mind in response to that question. Um, the, the first is uh, that communication uh, between the two places is really, really challenging um, because often they're completely unrelated to one another. And unless the child or the parent tells the school or the teachers or whomever that they have done some learning, then how, how does it get recognized? Um, Within one school that I know, they uh, one of their values is uh, belonging, uh, and the, what they mean by belonging is that feeling that you're in a family and you want to share, um, and and they encourage that um, that sharing of information about what you've been up to, um, and it seems like such an obvious thing, but that communication in every area of my life that I have experienced is always an issue. It's one of the hardest problems to make sure that everyone understands and knows exactly what they need to understand and know um, and it, it's constantly a challenge so the only thing we can do is do our best to uh, to do what we can to try and overcome that and try and come up with new, new ways uh, obviously the internet is a great help for that as well um, the experience that I would like to share um, uh, um, that, that sprang to mind uh, with an opportunity where a child had been learning outside of school was a, an extremely shy child um, and uh, she had been along to a Coda Dojo and, and um, she was actually at the school that I worked at and, uh, and I was running a code club at the time and um, she, so shy she was standing next to me in the playground and she couldn't communicate with me eye to eye at all so she was standing beside me and talking to me sort of like this like, mm. um, and uh, I asked her if she'd enjoy she came and stood next to me I asked her if she'd enjoyed the weekend and she said yes and and then she said um, I was just thinking um, can I talk at Code Club about this um, Obot, this particular amazing little cool robot that she'd been having fun with at the, at the Coda Dojo um, and the, she was so excited by the opportunity that she'd had outside of school that she wanted to share it with her peers um, and it still astounds me to this day how her uh, her um, shyness was was overcome by her passion um, so that's what we kind of need to ignite more I suppose get them so passionate about what they've learned and so passionate about um, the time that they've spent with us at a, a club um, or out of school summer program that they just have to share it with everyone so and she um, did actually speak at, uh, in front of the co-club. I'm reminded too of how powerful show and tell right, continues to be for me as a teacher and as a learner and how um, if you've helped everybody to realize that everybody gets a turn and that everybody should have. I mean, Sue, you got ex like visibly excited 
talking about this thing that this kid's excited about, right? Everybody should feel that way and about something sometime and recognizing and making space for that, uh, whatever it is, with, within reason, um, is I think a really important aspect of a learning community, be it in school or out of school. All right. Well, we have hit the midway part of the program, which means it's probably time to start prototype. During this part of the show, we're going to work together to prototype or quickly create a resource for uh, teaching and or learning uh, in support of summer learning, right? That's the idea. And we want to build this on the web. It doesn't necessarily have to be all about summer learning on the web, but the web will be part of our vehicle to share this with others. So if you have ideas about what we could build or questions about what's possible, it would be great to put those in the chat or the pad right now, and we can kind of think aloud together as a community. Now, during past episodes, we've worked on uh, guidelines for women who are mentoring women and girls in STEM spaces. We've worked on an Internet of Things kind of starter kit, some places you can begin exploring that work and circuitry uh, connected to the web. And we've begun a Youth Civic Action Guide. So, uh, you know, guess just kind of quickly, is there a particular specific type of resource that you think is needed to enable more access to summer learning or to enrich summer learning or to help bring it back, you know, into the school setting? That's a thinker, so we'll, we'll pause for a minute and then see which direction we want to go. Um, I had uh, a thought that was... Um it's, it's kind of developed in, during this conversation on something else that I've been working on as well. Um, so uh, uh, where we were talking about the different levels um, of, uh, or I was talking earlier about the different levels of, of pupils, of, of um, children who might attend or people who might attend a club, and the different experiences as well. Um, maybe uh, an idea of how they can collaborate their skills together on a project. So if someone's got some experience with, um, say, Makey Makeys, and someone else has got some experience with Raspberry Pis, um, someone else has got some experience with um, creating animations, all sorts of things that can come together on a kind of an interactive display, um, an end result. I don't know. That's just a thought. Kind of like a um, mentorship connection board something like that. Yeah, a way of helping everyone to work together to end up with a collaborative end result so that they can um, can see that, um, yeah, a, a way to be able to merge them all together instead of just having individual projects and people working on their own. A lot of the time, um, coding and programming is thought of as something that is very solitary and working on computers and playing on computers is very, very solitary. And it's not. There's so much peer programming around and collaborative programming. It would be nice to actually help them to enjoy that. And if computing is their thing, um, some, sometimes that social side can be... Um, kind of lacking a little bit sometimes to be able to help them to grow and build on that and have the opportunity to interact as well might might be a good thing. Sue, you're making me think of. Um, I think there's a make that Chad created that says I did something I did this summer, um, or six words to describe my summer or something like that. So as I see Chad kind of thinking about this right now, but um, there's a make like that that could be a place where uh, people you know, remix and they share their whatever they did or information about what they did and then, you know, having that feed into a larger quilt that represents the class. So we've done this before, um, which are digital quilts um, and they are places where multiple people can add their make, as we call it, so something they create online, which is this reference, what I'm referencing that Chad's done, um, and they add it in there and it, it kind of, it goes through them and it circles through them. So I, I'm thinking in a way where everyone's doing different things and they can actually, you know, edit that using this make, um, inputting it into the make, and then it all feeding into this larger picture that represents like a classroom or a school or something. Um, I don't know, if, but that just kind of, I'm riffing off your vibe there and your idea to see if that even resonates with anyone or is a cool example that could be used by people um, in the classroom setting. I think it really links in with the, um, the communication thing that we were just talking about, to be able to share that information back about that. Yeah. Um, and if, um, if children are from a particular area, um, 
then share that with all the schools and they've got that communication there if it's just sent out straight away and they can look at it and see if any of their own pupils have been in attendance and then celebrate it without the child having to be responsible for that. That would be really cool for that. I, I wonder about the um, some of the generative tools like that. Like the, That's a great idea of a a thing that you can make that people can contribute to that helps with discovery, but I wonder about other generative uh, tools like, uh, this sounds really boring, but agendas and protocols for what a, what a day-long or a week-long workshop would look like. I've found that it's really easy to plan a workshop once I have a good sort of like, um, I used to run these two-week summer camps for teachers, um, and once we knew what the day-to-day -day structures looked like, like what we were teaching didn't really matter because we could we could fit those sort of habits into like, oh, we need time for individual work. We need time for group work. We need time for establishing norms. We need time to come back together and share what we did. We need time to have each pe each person in a uh, in sort of a, a sharing role. Uh, those sorts of resources seem really important uh, and really easy to hack too. Once you get a, a rough one started, uh, it's pretty easy to rip it off and make a copy and go to town. That seems really interesting, like a uh, almost like a building blocks type of thing. <laughs> like um, this sort of box that's like group activity versus the reflection. And I'm just thinking of how to make that. Um, I think it, it'd be fun and then you can sort of like have an archive of these things and sort of rebuild other classes with stuff that you did in the past. Yeah, that'd be really dope. Really fun. So uh, maybe something we could do. I think it looks like we're probably going to be at around line 75, 76 on the Etherpad now. You know, what if we worked together and thought through that kind of um, planning or convening guide? Like here, but here are the here are the best ways we found to bring people together for summer learning. And we could think about you know things to do before, things to do like day of or during, uh, things to do after. And then we could use something like the digital quilt or Skillshare's idea as the content for for the middle for the for the during part. Does that sound does that sound useful? So it would be kind of an exemplar. So we'd want to kind of hack together on the the guidelines for like what makes a great summer convening, what really helps protect that space for the kinds of summer learning that are possible. So facilitation tips, logistic details, um, and then a kind of um, you know we can also hack together on a kind of uh, lesson plan or point towards some uh, thimble project that we could use for the digital quilts. And if we have time, you know, at the end, like, how can we document and share what happened? Does that sound right? All right. Yeah. Seems nodding, yes. So. In compelling like webcast nodding of heads. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. I like this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like a teacher during summer, he was like, work. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> slow down, slow down, slow down. Well, let's hack. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm All right, let's have fun with it. All right, <laughs> line 79, line 80. Let's uh, let's just set up the scaffold, hack on it. Audience members, this is a an awesome time for you to participate right in that scaffolding and contribute uh, your thoughts and you know your expertise to the thing we're building right on the pad. Also, a great time, I think, uh, over in the chat or on the pad itself to show us examples of what you think are great, like scaffolds for summer learning opportunities or for convening events for, for youth outside of, you know, in informal spaces outside of school. Um, so please go ahead and get hacking with us or go ahead and get sharing. Uh, we're going to set a few things up here and we'll also keep scanning for questions and kind of surface some of those as we go and think aloud. All right, let's do it. Can I ask a new question? I feel like you're muted, bud. Hey, I turned my microphone off, so double noob moment. How do I embed a bullet in the uh, in the uh, Etherpad? Is that just a formatting button up top? Exactly right. Okay. All right. For, forgive my ignorance. No, no, that's good. That's good. Interesting. So while we are working on this, there are some great questions still up at the line 60. So um, guess there's a, I think this is super important. I see the, the resource uh, socioeconomic divide issue. 
We have some great programs in our city for underprivileged and for the privileged, but these programs often don't intersect. So I feel like this expands the cultural divide. Does anybody have success in creating programming that brings more diverse groups together? I feel like that's right up my alley uh, in terms of programming that brings diverse groups together. And I think once it, it's, it's, it starts from what is the type of uh, questions um, we're asking, I think one of, one of the programs that we were putting together not too long ago, um, we recognize, and, and, and it also begins with naming, um, we recognize in Philly there's this street, City Line Avenue, across that street is like the quote-unquote suburbs um, and on the other side of the street is still you know, very much so close to uh, a, a huge working-class uh, community and naming that divide and then bringing people from both sides that um, sort of like quote-unquote border or boundary together to talk about why does this exist um, was the basis for a very meaningful project um, so Name, naming, right? I think naming is, is is important. That naming, right? And differences are important, and that the work should be about, you know, not you know erasing those differences, but learning how to work together through difference to some sort of more emancipatory aim. Um, and I think you could do that with a lot of things, um, it, like storytelling is a, is a great. Uh, avenue to be able to do that. Um, technology fits in that way in, in terms of like how can we you know tell a story that is bigger than wh who we are. Um, but yeah, I mean that it is it is a challenge and I think it's a really important challenge for the time that we're in right now where there are so many quote unquote borders and boundaries and lines, artificial lines that we need to overcome. Practicing that, you know, it's really important. If students got that over a summer you know, we could probably change the world in a couple years. <laughs> that's awesome. I think, right, that's the um, that's hope, even if it's not changing the world, like kids realize they can change their worlds. That, that agency is so powerful and so important. Um, let's see. What else do we have up here? Other great questions. This is very interesting. So someone asked you a particular question about digital leaders, but I'd like to kind of um, pull this out because we talked about like consent or choosing to to show up. Um, how do you think, you know, what are ways to encourage learners, you know, summer learners, especially youth, like what are your strategies for helping the most learners possible? Like see themselves or anticipate themselves as part of your program so that they're like, I you know I could do that, I could be there, that looks that looks relevant to me or that looks like awesome or delightful to me to kind of approach it in, in that direction. How do you, you know, widen that scope of students who think about self-selecting for your work? And I've just um, just added a line and actually which kind of links with what you're saying there um, or what you're asking um, so not all children would be happy to work so not all teenagers would be happy to work with younger children um, age range can sometimes be um, restrictive um, however if you are to encourage the older members to consider mentoring and it doesn't have to be digital skills it could be soft skills that they could um, uh, could be offering out um, as well as gaining uh, from that experience um, but mentoring might mean that they can see themselves being present at that event um, or, uh, or activity um, as well so. So, Bud, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Because you've got library programming year round, so this is this is something that you that you often deal with. Um, how how do you do that? How do you like extend the invitation? What do we call it? We call it um, Mimi. Make it more inviting. What are your strategies for that? Um, uh, some simple things that are working really well here, and and one of the things I should say is that. Working on infrastructure at the library means that I'm supporting the people who are doing these sorts of events now, which is a really hard role for me because I'm used to being the guy who does the events. Um, but I'm watching and learning a lot from how they do it. Um, there's there's both the formal invitation and there's the informal invitation. So we we think about the audiences we want to serve. We publish a lot of everybody here makes 
posters, man. Posters, posters, posters. But then we also uh, go to the places where the people who we want to come are, and we spend time with them. And we try to invite them in. And, and we look for ways to um, honor their interests and expertise in the events that we do. So um, one really cool thing that we do is, is we've, we've noticed that we don't have a lot of teenagers here uh, at the library. Well, the, the high school, the one high school in this town is, and I'm pointing, it's like eight blocks that way, right? Like I can walk to it from here. And, and in fact, sometimes students do. So we go there during lunchtime. We have a bookmobile. Um, which is like bringing the library to the space, but we don't actually take that anymore because we no no high school student wants to hang out on a bookmobile. Um, we actually have a little push cart <laughs> we bring in and we set up as like a, a mobile kiosk. And I, I'd love to say, well, we um, our team librarian is is really gifted at that. So she spends a ton of time being in the spaces where the teens are and and building those relationships. And those relationships turn into participation in events. And we learn things about the types of events that we're not offering that our, our audience is which we were. So last weekend we had our first skateboard competition, um, which was an opportunity for us to showcase our new GoPro camera that folks can check out. But more importantly, it was an event that a bunch of kids who come to the library and play video games and want to be left alone to play video games said was a thing they'd, they'd come to. And we had like 70 teenagers at the thing. Um, which for us is like winning uh, the, the Nobel Prize of, of event planning or something. I mean, it was great. Um, so, so really being in conversation with the people that you're serving and figuring out how to, how to facilitate experiences that they want to have, but also figuring out ways to let them facilitate. So that the teams actually plan that event, and, and we just used our, our logistical sense to help make that happen. That's great. Um, I love man, just youth and skateboarding. That's, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, I have a question. This is something that we um, often think about in terms of making things more inviting and uh, helping a, a broader audience see themselves involved in our work. We think a lot about what communication channels to use, particularly on the web. Uh, and we uh, haven't asked too specific a web question tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and hazard one. Um, yeah, what are the best ways to use the web to reach out to the communities that that you serve? Um, even if it's not like in a traditional way, or it's not your main channel of communication uh, for your projects and your programming. Um, how would you advise others who are starting out? Like, you know, what's an impactful way I might be able to use the web to to reach an audience uh, while I'm still planning, or you know, while I'm trying to convene people together? Definitely getting onto Twitter and Facebook and um, beginning to promote yourself as an entity um, and uh, just dropping in little comments to say, just keep an eye out or watch out coming soon and just little bits and pieces like that tantalize your audience as it were. Um, and uh, also something that I found really helpful is Eventbrite, um, just to be able to uh, keep track of everyone who's attending, um, be able to communicate with them if you have information that you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I need to share this with them. Um, I didn't tell them that they need to bring lunch or the, the weather's suddenly going to change and they can't park in that car park anymore because it's going to be flooded. I don't know. Whatever um, ad hoc things you suddenly need to share with them, it's a really great uh, tool for communication um, as well as, um, as making it look more um, professional as well. And if it's a free event and you're not charging for it, then you don't actually have to, to pay to use the tool either, which is fantastic. Well worth it. I, I think, too, it's important to use a bunch of different spaces to say the same thing a bunch of different, a bunch of different ways, but kind of the same way a bunch of times. Um, and, and be willing to invest in some things and not in others. Right? So when I get to the library, we've, we've got a Twitter account, we've got a Facebook account, we've got a web page, we've got another web page, we've got an online catalog, we've got all the tools, the library, library uh, web spaces right now are, are really sort of creepy uh, in a bunch of different ways uh, because of all the different vendors that are trying to tell us how ebooks are supposed to be and this and that and the other thing and they're like push spaces and so building good healthy um, two-way spaces is really hard but be, being willing to look at your space and, and always um, reinvest in the channels that are working and, and then reevaluate the ones that aren't. Either stop and focus on the places where you're having conversation and invite people to that party, or look for new uh, conversations to have. Um, I'm a huge Twitter person, and I hate Facebook. The people who attend and, and interact with our library love Facebook, and Twitter is this uh, ghostly 
uh, devastated wasteland of nothingness. Um, okay, cool. So when I want to tell people about what's up at the library, I don't use Twitter to do it. Um, I go where the where the audience is, uh, and then we're constantly looking and seeing where they are and where we want to be. Um, our team librarians having great space uh, success, like like a lot of team uh, folks are right now with Instagram, because it's not Facebook and it's not Twitter. And the kids like it. I'm sure we've only got about six months before Snapchat is where uh, we're going to want to do our library stuff, <laughs> and then you know three months after that it's whatever. Uh, it's always changing. Uh, being open to that. You don't have a library Snapchat, bud. No. <laughs> So I will. I will. I will confess that uh, I apparently have no Snapchat literacy whatsoever. I'm, I'm frequently, I look at it and I, I I press things and it does not work. And I the kids. Yeah, these days. I, I refuse. Every every day I get a new thing with somebody's filtered face on it, but I, I refuse. Um, <laughs> in, in Philadelphia, we um, I would say it's two sort of two strategies, right? And I think one is like if you're building a list or if you're quote unquote working a list, if you have uh, people that are already sort of connected. In terms of building a list, I don't, I'm, the digital screen time first is probably not the best place to reach um, um, everybody. You can reach some people, right? Those who are connected and are looking for opportunities, but in terms of, um, I'm thinking of like North Philly and my community, the best place to start from like a place-based thing, right? And um, mobile, would be the best to some have some sort of signs or things in uh, really meaningful places like the corner store. We call them poppy stores, um, and have these have the signs up say text here for more information, and then have some sort of mobile sign up process. Um, I, th I think that's the best uh, in terms of like getting people together. Uh, in terms of like working a list, um, especially when for young people who are like. They can decide if they want to go, but you know the real person that you're trying to move is the parent. Um, the phone conversation is still really, really important. Um, so it's like building up towards that moment and sealing and sealing the deal and having you know parents say, "Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna send my kid here." And you know once that sort of like deal and you hear the tone of her voice, you understand that that kid's gonna be there. And um, you know maybe consent might have went out the window, but that kid's going to be there. Um, so it's it's always uh, like that. And I, uh, so I I do see like we're still very much so in a um, multiple and but you talk about like multiple in person and multiple spaces. And don't forget like the sort of like public physical space and where are people trafficking. Um, it's really important right now in Philly. I'd say too. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to add, like, knowing your audience is really important. I'm struggling with, like, I want to do more uh, events that are sort of second tier, sort of techie events here at the library. The audience doesn't show up for those, right? Uh, we were we were leaning in really hard to building a more active sort of workshop maker space here at the library. We, we, we did a lot of outreach. We asked our community. That's not something they want right now. That, that itch is getting scratched in some different ways. What we found out is they want... Um, sort of techy, robotic, -y, electronic -y stuff. They really don't want like like a woodworking, physical. Let's build stuff together. Uh, uh, that was hard to hear, um, but it was important to realize that my agenda was we need that space. It wasn't necessarily the community's agenda. And and there's a fine line to strike between when you think something needs to be there and when the the folks who are there and using the space and and are the the audience for it just aren't interested. The audience is actually something I think's got a lot, um, a lot of places in in this conversation as well. I've just included a, a line in there about um, things to do during, and one of the things that I found a lot of the time with um, with children when they're creating is that they don't actually think about who's going to use their creation. They tend to often only think of it as being what they want, um, and that can mean that that's fine from their point of view. But when they come to share it with other people. They don't understand it. They don't know what they need to do. They can't be as excited about it as they need to be. Um, it's, it's like with MozFest. We're currently planning for MozFest at the moment, and, um, and I'm helping to um, it, create an exciting space. And we've done a lot of work thinking about who our audience is going to be so that we can create this amazing, exciting um, space that they actually want to be in. Um, if the children don't have the opportunity to go through that same thing, uh, it, it's relevant in whatever they do, in, whether they're writing um, or, or creating a digital make. Um, 
they, they're losing out on that opportunity to really celebrate it and have other people celebrate it and value what they've done and then they might not have that feeling that they then want to do it again and that would be a real shame. Um, that's a good point too. Our, our annual event of the year, MozFest, is a, a great time to think and, and pull in learnings that we've had from how people show up and engage in these out of, out of school times and places. Um, one pro tip, I actually added it, this in as well, um, is just to remember that every city or place around the world, um, I find that many of them, not all, um, but usually have sites where parents are looking and others are looking for summer activities. So, you know, take advantage instead of creating and going to all these wonderful places and resources that you already have, um, taking advantage of the places that are actually already have these networks and are wanting to share this sort of stuff and information out. Um, and have people coming to them looking for what to do. Um, so I think those are just good tidbits to consider. Um, there's lots of other really, really great examples in this Etherpad, uh, but we are wrapping up in five minutes, um, and we did promise to cut exactly on time uh, this session, so I'm going to encourage people to continue to add their links and resources and comments within there as we build out this entire facilitation guide, which is really coming along quite nicely. Um, there's a lot of ideas and activities in there, and I'm excited just going through and reading the different examples people have added, so thank you. Um, we're going to quickly just do one-minute uh, loops of feedback, final thoughts, and just see what people are doing, uh, and then call it a day. So um, I've shared kind of my reflections already, but I'm just really excited and jazzed. I think that summer is an amazing opportunity uh, to do learning and activity, you know, as we consider both indoors and outdoors. Um, and with various audiences, and knowing and speaking continuously, connecting with these audiences to understand what they find is exciting, connected to their passion, is going to just help all of us in the long run. So um, thank you for coming and sharing that. Uh, did we want to go in an order and anyone else say their final reflections? Sue, do you want to jump in and share any final thoughts or reflections? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, no, I just realized that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, I just think it's great to have an opportunity to be able to share like this, to collaborate and um, get lots of people to, to give their varying experiences. Um, there's, there's so much to gain from uh, every event. So if that's the case, there can only be lots to gain from other people. So I guess the parting thought is communicate with as many people as you can, talk to as many people as you know, um, and uh, and hopefully through doing that, then you'll find more mentors to be able to involve as well um, to help you facilitate any event that you do. I got something. Um, first, I'm really interested in the artwork that's behind Sue's face. I'm just trying to figure that one out. Um, and also, <laughs> yeah, exactly that one. Um, and also, um, uh, I was listening to Sue talk about so like the end user, the work that Youth Radio does out of Oakland is amazing. I just dropped their uh, uh, website and um, also like a little article that talks about um, their approach to like having young people and older elders come together to work for something that's for external audience and all the complications and the beautiful struggle that that is. Um, so shared that and uh, yeah, this was really exciting. It wasn't. It wasn't as I thought I was going to be like building things with my hands and cutting up paper. But no, this is good. I like it. I do feel like sometime though we should be in, instructed to bring scissors and paper because I think that would actually have added a nice level to the prototyping. No, I, I love the format too. I guess I would say that um, one thing I've really been reflecting on this year and, and was reminded of today is, um, and I put it in the in the guide. Um, it feels really good to say, we need an X, and I should go build an X. Before you do that, look around and see if somebody's already building X, right? Look for partners and friends. Think about what it is you and your organization can offer and what resources you have available, and look for people that are doing the same type of thing and figure out how you can work together, right? Um, we're really good at promoting events and having space and talking to people. We're not necessarily the best at knowing what plants go in your garden. The extension service down the street is. We invite them in, and we're really good at events. They're really good at gardens. We, we work together, and I think that's true of, of a lot of things, is look for, look for partnerships uh, where you can and try to figure out how you can contribute something that only you can uh, contribute. 
All right, well, I'm going to wrap up with my thanks for fantastic guests, uh, wonderful audience. You're so generous with your contributions. We appreciate all of you. Our next community call is on June 29th. The next Teach the Web Chat is on June 30th. And we'll be back on July 12th to talk about brokering web literacy opportunities around the world. Thank you so much, and goodbye. Bye. Thank you.